Alright guys, welcome to another episode of Ken's Troubles. Episode number 57, Seoul, South Korea. I had him just arriving at the airport, there was this little robot thing just uh, riding throughout the airport, kind of creeped me out. Um, it's kind of weird, I really like the direction that the road is headed in with all this stuff, but it was really creepy how like when I tried to record it, it kept turning away from me multiple times. Now here, I'm in the Hyundai University area, and the Hyundai area as well. This is an area where there is a lot of youthful culture and a lot of uh, younger crowds. Obviously because the university is there, it's kind of like an art university. And this is about maybe five, seven minutes away from my Airbnb. Like, this was just a perfect spot. I didn't realize like how jam-packed and how much stuff was going on around here when I booked the Airbnb. But uh, basically, it's a straight shot from the airport. Uh, you leave from Echeon, you take the train, and it takes you right to uh, Honda University Station. It takes about an hour on the train. Now, normally of late, when I've been taking uh, trips, I normally take the airport transfer. And it's normally on average in multiple countries, cost me about 20, 25 bucks. And in this case here in Seoul, it would have been like 100 bucks. So I refuse to do that because I'm not going to go from paying 25 in one place to 100 in another. So I caught the train and the train was only about five bucks. So you can imagine like if I would have caught that airport shuttle from the airport and back, that would have been like almost $200. Whereas I could just catch the train and it's about $10 to and back. I think anytime you're taking a trip that you should always try to be like cost conscious. Some things obviously you want to pay more for, some things you want to pay less for. I never just want to be completely bougie and just live it up and just pay an exuberant amount for everything. And it has to be like a balance. Some things cheaper, some things a little bit more. Now some of you may be wondering about the prices in Seoul, South Korea. Um, Seoul is a little bit more expensive than some of the other places that you'll see in the upcoming videos that I went to. Um, case in point, I went to this little chicken spot and I got like three different kinds of chicken and three different flavors and it also came with like coleslaw it was like about 20 bucks all together um which isn't like a crazy amount especially by american prices but still um it was a little bit more than i would have had to pay in some of the other places i'm not telling you what those other places are because i want to keep it a surprise for uh, upcoming episodes so like i said about 20 bucks at the chicken joint that was pretty good um but there are all these different places there's hundreds of places that you could eat in this area shops clothes and everything else like that so you can find all different types of price variations in this general area as you can see there to my left there's a 7-eleven like it really pisses me off when i see the americanization of uh, the world oh, i don't even know if the 7-eleven is an american thing I'm, I'm not sure but still just seem to piss me off the same as it makes me more when i see like mcdonald's burger king five guys even came across a popeyes which we'll see in another episode which i thought was absolutely crazy especially where it was at um but i will admit as the days go on and i get tired of trying to figure out the food places and everything so i ended up just eating at some american restaurants as well So now I want to talk a little bit about the food choices. Uh, while I was there, like I said, I had the chicken, the three different flavors, that was fine. Um, I also got like this grape drink and it was, it tastes just like green grapes and it had like a fizz to it and then it had like green grape chunks at the bottom of it and some little sugar in it. Man, that was so good. I went back multiple times and got that and then I also had variations of it like they had a red grapefruit one with red grapefruit chunks at the bottom of it and it has some other flavors too like mango etc but I didn't get a chance to try those ones the third thing that I tried uh, is like this little grilled cheese sandwich that you're seeing here um, it's like grilled cheese uh, egg ham, and then it had like some sugar um, on top of it like it was excellent and it tastes so good I went back as well multiple times and I think I might have went back either two or three times to uh, get that next up um, I said a recurring thing that I'm going to start doing during these episodes. One thing I want to make an entire episode about it is racism. Uh, here I haven't encountered too much racism, but I did encounter a little bit when I was at the restaurant where I got the chicken. It seemed like the people that waited on me, it seemed like they were kind of standing around waiting to see like if I was going to pay or something. That really pissed me off. And then there was these guys sitting at the table right next to me. Um, I felt running their eyes on me, and so I looked. 
and he was like staring at me he had a smirk on his face so like I'm looking at him and then he just starts like busting out laughing at me and so at that point I gave him like the Luigi death sting anytime somebody does that to me or staring at me inappropriately or staring at me in ignorance or something of that nature I just give him a Luigi death sting until they stop staring at me I lost South Korea uh, the, only reason, the main reason I came to South Korea was because uh, the other country that I was at before here, catching a flight back to the United States would have been extremely expensive. And so as I was like Googling around trying to find cheaper flights, I found South Korea and I just had a deal that just cannot be beat. I mean, this deal was so amazing to go all the way from South Korea to fly back to New York and have to jump on it. So while I was here, I said I would stay for a day or two. Which brings me to number two. The second reason I came to South Korea is because of the DMZ, the Demilitarized Zone, the border between North Korea and South Korea. And so I did that tour, and you'll see that in a minute. Now here, this area, this is the area where the bars and the nightclubs are. I stumbled across this part by accident. This is also about five, seven minutes away from my Airbnb. Um, there was a lot of people standing outside that tried to get me to go into the clubs, but I hesitated and I didn't go because. You know, especially being by myself, sometimes I really go by myself, and on an international trip, you know, sometimes the bouncers or they could try to charge you way more than what it actually costs, and then the bouncers or somebody might not let you leave, have to worry about somebody possibly spiking your drink, um, you know, somebody could also set you up where a female or a male is trying to set you up, act like they're interested in you, trying to have sex, leave, go back to the hotel or something, and then next thing you know, some type of setup, the next thing you know, you're getting kidnapped or something, so I will go out, but I kind of stay away from it too. Next up is the DMZ tour. We started out at Imjin Gak Park, which has a tour center, amusement park, and monuments and statues reflective of the Korean War. Next up is the Peace Bell. It was unveiled in 2000. It is a bell for peace and the eventual reunification of the two Koreas. Now, there are other peace bells in the world, and this is one of them. Next up is the Freedom Bridge. This bridge here is where 12,000 Korean and UN troops were released from the north to gain their freedom and cross this bridge. Next up is the Statue of Peace, also known as the Comfort Woman Statue. The statues are a symbol of the victims of sexual slavery by the Japanese during World War II. Next up is the Skywalk experience for the Dake Bridge. It is a bridge that was heavily damaged during the Korean War. It consists of three parts, past, present, and future. The first part is in the form of a passenger coach from the former steel train that used to operate on the railway line, which once connected Seoul and Pollyanna. The present part of the Skywalk features a restored section of the railway and railroad ties on a glass floor, offering visitors a view of the Imjin River and even bullet holes on the Dake Pairs from the war. The future portion is divided into two floors. The lower level is a semi-open observatory deck with a view at the foot of the Dake Bridge and the river, whereas the upper level provides a wider view of the Imjin River, its ecosystem, and the civilian restricted zone south of the DMZ. This is known as the DMZ train and this train is a train that used to bring supplies to both North and South Korea during the war. However, the United States military was concerned that it would end up in the North Koreans' hands, so they destroyed it with the machine gun barrage of over a thousand bullet holes. It is preserved here at the park as a memory of the Korean War and the catastrophic and devastating impacts that the war had. Next up, we were able to purchase North Korean currency at the park. I was really excited about this and happy because I don't know how difficult it is to get North Korean currency, but now I feel as if I have a piece of history. Next up, we were on the bus on our way to the DMZ, and before they would let us access to the demilitarized zone, uh, they sent troops on the bus and they had to check 
every single last one of her passports. Now here we are crossing over into the DMZ. As you can see, some of the troops there. You also see some of the barriers on the bridge. This was one of my favorite parts of this vacation. Um, this is about as close as I'm going to be able to get to North Korea right now, even though I would love to go there one day to visit. But in the meantime, this will have to suffice to give you a little information about the DMZ zone. The Korean Demilitarized Zone is 160 miles long and separates North and South Korea by buffer zone that is 2.5 miles wide. Now, there are over a million landmines in this area, separating the two. The DMZ was established in 1953 as part of the Korean Armistice Agreement, which ended the Korean War. The agreement required each side to move their troops 1.2 miles back from the flat line, creating the DMZ. The DMZ is one of the most heavily guarded areas in the world. Next up, we're going to the top of Mount Dora to Dora Observatory. At Dora Observatory, you'll get the best views across the border. It's also a favorite amongst guests due to its proximity to North Korea and unobstructed views. The observatory features several high-power binoculars on the third floor open roof. The roof provides clear views of several sites, including a North Korean village, the North's ninth largest city, statues, and the Kaesong Industrial Complex. The observatory was rebuilt to provide a better viewing angle and reopened at the end of 2018. Now here, I just took some pictures on my phone of North Korea, uh, just zoomed in on my phone. I also took some videos with my phone. Uh, it was pretty much that close, and you could also see the flags of both countries uh, on both sides. Now here, this is when we're leaving Mount Dora once we left our observatory. We're just walking down the hill, uh, getting ready to go to the DMZ or demilitarize zone. Next up is the demilitarized zone, and this is a sign outside of the third tunnel that we're about to go into that our tour guide told us to stand and take pictures in front of. It's just a great way of saying that, hey, look, I was here. Now, here is the entrance before we go into the third tunnel. As you can see, there are four hats to the left and right of us. We had to put those on. After that, in the next photo, you'll see we go on a long descent. And that descent down is a lot steeper than what it looks like in the photo. It took about 10 minutes. And I wasn't too happy about it because I was like, man, I'm going to have to walk right back up the steep ass hill. Oh, <laughs> this is done and over with. So anyway, once you're down inside of the tunnel, it's kind of short because uh, the Koreans are short. And being that I'm six feet tall, I was a lot taller uh, for the tunnel. So I banged my head into the ceiling like four separate times. Again, thankfully, they gave us a hard hat. It was pretty cool getting to the end just to see uh, what the Koreans were up to with this tunnel. To give you a little bit more information about the tunnel, uh, the tunnel is only 27 miles from Seoul, South Korea, and the incomplete tunnel was discovered in October 1978, following the detection of an underground explosion in June 1978. Apparently caused by the tunnelers who had progressed 1,427 feet under the south side of the Korean demilitarized zone. It took four months to locate the tunnel precisely and dig an intercept tunnel. Now, at first, North Korea denied building the tunnel, um, but they later found out that they were building the tunnel for an invasion of South Korea even after the armistice was signed. They said that they could have 30,000 North Korean troops per hour go through the tunnel to invade South Korea. A total of four tunnels have been discovered altogether. However, they're believed to be up to 20 more. Uh, they still tried to find the tunnels, but the tunnels aren't as significant as they were back in the day since North Korea's long-range artillery and missiles have become much more effective. All right, this was the final stop on the DMZ tour, and this is the Glow Cluster Heroes Bridge. It's dedicated to the 1st Battalion Glow Cluster Regiment of the British Army who fought in the Korean War. The 1st Battalion fought fiercely against Chinese troops and unfortunately lost the battle. This bridge commemorates the sacrifices they made in a foreign land. Now, a little bit about the bridge. It holds up to 900 people, which seems absolutely crazy. I know for me, myself, I wouldn't be getting up on it with 900 other people. I'd rather get up there with about four and take my chances. This bridge also can withstand a seven magnitude earthquake. Now, you do have to walk up some steps on that dirt hill to get up to the top of the bridge. Uh, we were a little bit over it after walking through that third tunnel and the DMZ. 
But once you get to the top, the views are absolutely spectacular and breathtaking. Once you get across the bridge, there is this waterfall. Um, it's nothing like too spectacular, but it's cool uh, to see it once you get across the bridge. All right, that concludes another episode of Ken's Travels. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Uh, yeah, we have a lot more content coming your way. I just about five or six more episodes of other countries that I've visited over the summer. Wanted to get this one out first because if it's a country that I spent the least amount of time in, so it would be a lot easier to edit uh, quickly and get it out to you. But yeah, stay tuned. And as always, like, subscribe, and I'll see you on the other side. Thanks.